you everybody for coming tonight. Um, I'm incredibly happy to see you and I, I'm not just saying that. I, I've been struggling with this topic about um, China's hidden influence in the UK since February and, I've been <laughs> and I felt very alone with it. So it's really great to be in a room with some sensible people to try and try and put our minds together to see if we can make sense of what is this hidden influence. Um, and and well, to do this, I've, I'm joined by Isabel Hilton, um, who I hope I'm a, it's, I have to kind of, I'm a bit of a, I'm like basically his, Isabel, if you don't know her, she is the master of China reporting. And so as a China reporter, it's, it's quite a big deal for me to meet her and to, to do this with her. So um, she is not only a journalist about China, but she's also the founder of a nonprofit website called China Dialogue. Um, which I think we'll talk about later because I'll come to that later. And Mark Wheatley, are you here somewhere? He's online. Mark, I'm really glad you're here as well. Mark, somebody that I've been talking to as I've been trying to work this out. He is um, a consultant in the city of London. He works in finance and he's also an elected representative, a councillor in the city of London as well. Um, and he's one of the few people at work and in a position of authority who's really been open to me about what he's what he's seeing in the financial sector about China's hidden influence. Um, and this title, I didn't come up with this title, Mark, did you come up with this title? I love the title because China's hidden influence, to me, you know, there's, there is the covert hidden influence that the China's Communist Party is, 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 um, you know, is performing, is interested in, is happening here in the UK. But there's also, as I've been working on this, this other kind of hidden influence that I've become in a way more fascinated by, which is China's overt agenda, overt influence, but that people in the UK, institutions all across the UK, UK in universities, businesses, parliament, people have been complying with. Um, and, but in a way, it's hidden because it's, we're not talking about it. And maybe it's hidden because it's a little bit even unconscious or it's not recognized or people don't have the information or understanding to really understand what they're doing or, to, or haven't, we haven't really spoken about what's at stake um, when, when people are complying with the CCP in that way. So um, that's why we're here. That's why I've brought you together. So I thought we could really try and put light on all these hidden, different hidden influences. Um, maybe even try and find some new language to talk about it. I, I, I stumble with comply over. There's, I feel like it's such a new thing that's happening. I don't even have the words necessarily. And we've also got a historian here somewhere online, um, Daniel Pick, who's written a book just, that's just about to come out called Brainwashed, A History of Thought Control. And brainwashed is not the right word for this. I sometimes think about self-censorship, but, but he's going to tell us about the origin of that word, which actually came from Chinese. Um, and, and also help us if anyone's got any new language or can come up with new vocabulary to describe what we're trying to talk about. That would be really great as well. But first, I just thought I would ask you, does anyone feel like they have been influenced by the Chinese Communist Party covertly, overtly, through fear? Any, any way? Does anyone have any think they might have been? I feel like I have in all of those ways. <laughs> <laughs> but no, okay. All right. Well, shall I start, Isabel? Would you be able to talk to us about the covert influence that you're worried about in Britain from the um, CCP? Yes. Well, uh, what does it consist of? I, I mean, it, it, it's new and it's not new. So if you think back to the Cold War and what the USSR did, um, or indeed what the CIA did in reverse. You're trying to get your point across through cultural influence, through economic interest. You're setting up um, groups that are in support of your aims and ambitions and so on. And that was, you know, that was part of the kind of Cold War game. The difference with China is that you've got all that, plus being the, second, the world's second largest economy and the world's biggest market in many ways. So that you have added... Um, enormous economic heft 
And that, that actually expands your range of opportunities. Nobody really thought they were going to make a fortune out of the Soviet Union. And you certainly weren't going to buy a Soviet mobile phone if, the, if such a thing had existed, because it would have been the size of a brick and probably green. Um, but, you know, China is embedded in all our supply chains. We have this love-hate relationship with China. And, um, and the way in which our commercial relationships have expanded China's possibilities is that, of course, you know, the kind of greed as well as the fear factor uh, comes into play. So, for example, Germany, uh, Volkswagen sells 40% of its cars in China. You know, that's a big, that's a big issue. Um, the instrument of influence, which uh, is a very long-standing part of the, an important part of the Communist Party, is called the United Front Work Department. The United Front Work Department's job, and it's a, it, it is a very important part of the party, domestically was to neutralise non-party elements. So not enemies of the party exactly, but things like religious bodies or... Uh, civic organizations when the party uh, won, when the communists won the civil war in 1949, they sort of looked around the landscape. And the point of a communist party is that you need, you need pretty much, you need ideological control. So you look at what the rival forms of um, belief are, and you either try to eliminate them or you try to neutralize them. And the United Front's work department's job is to manage those non-party elements so that they're not a threat to the party. When China went global, which it did after, um, and I'm sure you all kind of know the rough story, that after Mao died, Deng comes in, he opens China up to the world, China embarks on this, you know, 30, 40 years of double-digit growth, it becomes, it joins the WTO, it becomes the world factory, and that's all fine. Um, except that when China wants to go global, it has a problem about how to export this management of rival forms of belief and rival ideas. How do you do that on a global scale? You can do it in China, up to a point, um, relatively successfully. But trying to do it on a global scale is, an, is, is a challenge of a different order. And at that point, a number of things happen. The United Front Work Department gets a massive increase in its budget. It's also uh, given charge of another department which looked after overseas Chinese so that the United Front Work Department then has access to overseas Chinese to, you know, work on as well as spy on and use in various ways. And a huge investment in... Um, in kind of discourse control, so uh, broadcasting, you know, suddenly CCTV becomes CGTN and they're kind of broadcasting in every language. Um, the China Daily appears in life-threatening piles outside, you know, every uh, public outlet. Um, all of that goes on and the Chinese start to talk about telling the China story. So that's all part of it. So that's the kind of... Now, some of that is visible. The stuff I've described is fairly visible, and some of it is not visible. So some of it uh, works uh, on other, other places where thinking happens. Universities. A lot of thinking happens in universities. History is told in universities. One of the things the party doesn't like is what it calls historical nihilism, which is a form of history that the party... any 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 form of history the party disapproves of. So history that goes into the Great Leap Forward or the mass starvation of the early 60s or the Cultural Revolution in any detail or Tiananmen or any of those things. Um, that's historical nihilism and not encouraged. But of course, it happens in foreign universities. So you want to have an influence on campus. You want to have an influence on what people think about China, how they discuss China, because all of that is part of the kind of uh, thought universe in which you operate politically and commercially. So you want to try and control that. So all of that starts to happen. We get very large numbers of Chinese students uh, studying here at a point when our own universities are short of cash, so they become quick, quickly dependent on, on Chinese students. Um, Confucius Institutes are set up on campus. You know, this is like... Um, the um, Alliance Francaise or, or the Goethe Institute actually being on, on a, a, yeah, an academic campus, which, you know, no other country did. But for some reason, universities allowed this to happen, uh, to teach language, but then they start noticing that, you know, that chap in the history department has unsound views. And then they 
sort of conversations start to happen with vice chancellors about I'm sure Chinese students wouldn't want to come here if those unsound views were given any encouragement and that kind of goes on so people start I mean I'll give you an example Aberdeen University at one point had a, a corridor in which all the Nobel Prize Peace Prize winners uh, had their photographs and um, this apparently hurt the feelings of the Chinese students at Aberdeen University, so they complained. Hurting the feelings is a, one of those terms of art. Um, and so Aberdeen University redecorated the corridor and somehow the photographs never went up because it included, of course, a photograph of the Dalai Lama, Nobel Peace Prize winner. So all kinds of little things like that go on, but also quite bigger things go on. So if there is... Uh, China, China starts to get involved in academic conferences, international academic conferences, and starts to object to certain scholars attending them. And the universities don't really push back because by then they're in a situation of dependence. Um, and, and none of this is particularly visible. Um, amongst the Chinese students, there will be also party organisations. So for the Chinese students themselves, what they say in the classroom uh, will be noticed, will be reported. When a Chinese visitor comes, a state visit or a, or a you know, high-level Chinese visit, these students are turned out with um, identical flags and, you know, kind of... They're made... To, they're, they are encouraged uh, to go and, um, and form a pretty solid phalanx in front of the visiting leader so as to screen out um, the Tibet protest or the Xinjiang protest or whatever it is that might also happen when a leader visits. And actually, there were occasions on which the policing was such that those protests were pretty much, you know, beyond the... The leader, the visiting leader, couldn't see them because they were, they were placed at a suitable distance. So there was a flag of, you know flag-waving, as a sea of flag-waving young, enthusiastic, patriotic Chinese, and the protest was at a safe distance. I'm, I'm probably... Is this, is yeah, this the kind of thing you're yeah, looking for? But I yeah. just, uh, before I come to Mark, I just wanted to... Where does this end? Like, where does this go if we don't catch ourselves? Because with these small... Oh, we, we, we just... OK, we won't, we won't have that speaker, we won't say that now. I mean, yeah. that's what I was trying to... These tiny little acts... Yes, well, it's... Where, what does that... Well, I think I think the the question that what it what it poses to us is is the challenge to our own values and how much we believe in our own values and how much we are prepared to defend our own values because all of this erosion is really you know it's a contest of values um, you know China uh, is run by a communist party which has an ideology and a way of operating which it is trying to export and we need to recognise that it's not to say we should have nothing to do with China that's or patently absurd. It's a fifth of the world's population. But we need to set the terms of our relationship with China rather than allowing China to set the terms. And in this country, we have, I think, to a great degree, allowed China to set the terms. You may recall that under David Cameron, for example, um, David Cameron and George Osborne, and this was a policy largely made in the Treasury, they declared a golden era of uh, UK-China relations. Um, again, you know, kind of the idea was that if we were really snuggly with the Chinese, we could both influence China and we could benefit from um, this enormous economy and this market. This has been a story that China has used to, um, or has been around about China since the early 19th century. There was a famous quote from a Lancashire cotton mill owner who said, um, if every Chinese added uh, four inches to his shirt tail, the, <laughs> the cotton mills of Lancashire would never sleep. And you think, yeah, OK. Um, you know, A, China has cotton, B, they don't wear shirts, and, you know, kind of... But, but people kept on telling themselves these stories. And, 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 you know, right up to today, people were telling themselves these stories. Mm -hmm. And of course we should trade with China, but actually if you look at our trade with China, we were sacrificing all our kind of principles of academic freedom and freedom of speech to a country that we actually sold less to than we were selling to Belgium. You know, uh, the, the trade is not... You know, we, we don't trade well in goods with, with China, unlike Germany, which has a you know, big trade in goods. We never did. We trade in services, of which education is one of the largest ones. And at that time... George Osborne thought they wanted Chinese investment. That's another story of influence and now a degree of caution. But we, but 
very reckless mm -hmm. back then. Well, let's, let's go to Mark, who is right in the epicenter of investment in Hi. London. Hi, um, Mark. Hi, and uh, thanks, Poppy. Uh, I don't know if you've got a bit of reverberation. I, I can hear a bit of an echo, but um, would it be okay if I give you a little bit of background on the city? And I think, you know, Isabel's comments about values are important, but um, I mean, the city seems to always revolve around interest. Um, is it okay if I spend a moment or two on that and contextualize? Yeah. Great. Well, essentially, I've been a, a local politician in the square mile since 2013. And the city of London is, is quite unique. Um, and we are a local authority for the square mile at the heart of London. Um, we are also amateur politicians. And I think that makes us quite susceptible to being influenced. So with a few exceptions, we don't represent any political party. We're independent. And therefore, we have the opportunity to be quite independent in our thought and our, our communication but we are essentially not professional politicians and we can be influenced by, by I guess, business interest. Um, the square mile, as I say, performs those sort of uh, authoritative roles in, in you know, everything that a, a, another local authority will do, rubbish collection, police, that sort of thing. Um, but we also conventionally represent financial services abroad. And Isabel talked about the kind of professional services trade. Um, and with that, we have influence in Westminster and Whitehall and, and soft diplomatic engagement. So we do host state banquets. And, and during that golden era that Isabel was talking about, we hosted President Xi when he came to, to London in 2015. And that gives us kind of an intimacy in the relationship. Um, but there are three areas of financial services trade where, where, where the PRC has significance in the square mile. Uh, one is renminbi trading, and renminbi trading is, uh, well, it counts, I think, um, the last figures I have here are from 2020, but about 328 billion of trades in London in that year. Foreign direct investment, Isabel talked about um, the investment conversation, and I think about 3.6 billion sterling of investment in 2021. And then partnership, which city firms and the Corporation of London, the authority has uh, with Chinese partners on green bonds um, and green bonds are part of our wider environmental, social and governance activity. Um, so essentially, whilst China is by far the largest polluter in, in the world, um, the, the green bonds are to try and bake in good, in inverted commas, environmental practice and, and to create uh, financial structures that reward that. They, I think the first were only issued in about 2015, but by 2020, we had a total of about 44 billion of dollars uh, uh, of, of green bonds being issued through London. So those are the three kind of pinch points. Um, and the reason they're significant is, you know, if a city of London politician speaks up to question some of our behaviors, so for example, last October I did with some others on um, Essentially, you know, if we represent the Chinese government as our key partner on, on environmental, social and governance work, and particularly around green bonds, well, we have to consider the, the, the pollution in, 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 in the People's Republic, but we also have to consider the treatment of the Uyghurs. And you know, is that treatment in Xinjiang entirely congruent with um, a, profess, uh, a profession for environmental, social and governance principles? No, it, it absolutely isn't, because whether it's genocide or not, it's, um, yeah, there are slave labor camps in Xinjiang. And we in the Corporation of London don't really want to confront that because we tell ourselves that all we're about is, is trade promotion. We're about the interest part of political conversations rather than the values part. And I and a minority of my colleagues firmly believe that our prosperity ties back in some measure to our assertion of our values. And then you can get misty eyed about these things, but to some extent, the security that um, merchants had in, in the square mile the freedoms they had, but the security they had for their property and their person, to some extent, gave the foundation for good business. And when we do anything to question or challenge that relationship with the PRC, there is great unease. And in 2020, a colleague of mine, Andy Mayer, and I did some work. We put a motion up, which was quite innocuous or might be seen as quite innocuous just saying that if any BNOs, British nationals overseas in Hong Kong, are unsettled by the uh, national security law that had just been imposed on Hong Kong, and it, it's kind of strange practices, they would be welcome in the square mile. Um, that motion was opposed by the then Lord Mayor and the chair of our policy committee. Uh, we were rather surprised, but it, yeah, the motion was successfully carried. 
Um, and immediately after it, the Chinese ambassador um, issued a, a reprimand to the corporation. He reminded us, um, the then ambassador, of our trading relationship and told us to grow up when all we were doing was making a pretty innocuous statement about our values and, um, and offering a welcome to BNOs. And from that moment on, I, I sensed the corporation being very wary of doing anything that unsettles that relationship with the PRC, because we're told that there are 4,000 jobs at stake in Square Mile. Um, but what we're not being told is that that re relationship has a reciprocity. So we are performing a service that internationalizes renminbi, um, the, the yuan, for example, in renminbi trading. We are, you know, we're not simply recipients of charity and largesse from the Chinese government. Um, and we are kind of, I think, blind to the um, political aspects that Isabel talked about, the degree to which we are being suborned, I suppose. Um, we're not always mindful of, of, of our, I think, the real loot of our prosperity, which is our values. And we're quite hesitant. I mean, City of London politics is often led by people with a business background, but often um, a strong risk aversion. Um, they're technically able, they're exceptionally intelligent people, but they're schooled to, to, to manage risk and they don't necessarily always think about the bigger picture. Anyway, that's me jumping in. That's what, what I feel about. Mark, Mark um, can, I, can I just ask you, to what extent do you think um, this kind of turning a blind eye is people are receiving covert influence from the CCP, or is it just calculations about personal wealth gain? Or what, what, is, what do you see that's going on? Well, I mean, I think the gain is partial. And I think it's private. So, I mean, when we act as politicians, we need to be mindful that it's, it's some people in the city are benefiting from the relationship, but that it's their private interests that are benefiting. But it's all, you know, it's all known. Um, and then you know, the degree to which it's covert or over, well, I think it's, it's, for the most part, it's pretty open. You know, it is a business relationship. You can track those figures that I quoted for the significance of it. Um, and, and, in many respects, you know, I think you, you mentioned self-censorship. We're mindful that there is value that we get, um, uh, kind of a proper sort of pound, shilling and pence value here. And, and we are concerned about that without thinking about the value that we're creating for our partners. There are some covert aspects. I mean, you, know, you, you might not be familiar with the story of the, um, the new Chinese embassy or the financing of it, but Lord uh, Adney Lister, who's, who's a very close advisor of Boris is, um, was part of his team when he was mayor of London. And he's quite a well-known figure in, in the square mile as well. I mean, he's, he's put in a lot of work, uh, as others have, in developing relationships in the Corporation of London. But Lord Adney Lister has a, uh, uh, was deeply involved in taking the Chinese embassy to, um, to, 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 to uh, the Tower of London, to uh, the old Royal Mint. There was a lot of money that flowed around that deal. And yeah, I'm not entirely sure that story has been fully teased into the public yet. But um, you know, individuals are, are doubtless performing you know, legitimate and correct service. But but it does to some extent mean that they're um, well with people like Lord Dudley Lister, they're in a position where they're securing private gain and um, performing a public service, but also perhaps influencing others to be mindful of a relationship, perhaps excessively mindful of a relationship that you know, isn't benefiting necessarily the wider society. I'm not sure if I'm saying that very eloquently. It's the end of a, a long day. <laughs> is, there, is there anybody wanna, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm Seb, and I'm in the chat. I'm hosting the chat. Um, and there's been some really interesting questions in the chat. Um, so first of all, Chris C, he's unable to join. The, he doesn't have a mic or a camera, so he, um, so he can't join. But he, um, his question was about many countries influence each other. The UK, there's media in the UK that influences America, and all around the world, countries seem to be influencing each other. And he was wondering at what point that becomes wrong. So why, why do we say that it's wrong for China to influence um, our media and influence our movies. Um, and then Andrew um, Girdwood is online, and maybe we could bring him in to ask his question, um, but or to raise his point. But his point was that um, we've we've kind of historically had tensions since the beginning of time with China. And what is there something like particularly different now? But I, I was maybe Andrew could make it better. I don't know if I can. Um, but I mean, that's it. I mean, my first introduction to China at school was. 
just how badly Britain treated China when we uh, first introduced ourselves. And it basically seems to be a pretty traumatic relationship ever, ever since. Um, they, they, they've had the upper hand now. That's it. I'm kind of curious as well, like how much whoever's in charge, which individual is in charge at the time of the party, like how much does that set either the tempo, direction or depth of the influence that's being exerted at the time? Mm. So question, yeah. I, not to sort of get too conspiracy theory about it, but, you know, for instance, the education thing, has it and the academia sort of uh, influence, is that a sustained program or are they just sort of, is it just a movement of one thing to another? And so when you look at it from the outside, it looks like a sort of sustained campaign. And if it was a sustained campaign, is there one person that at one point in China was like, this is what we're gonna do for the next five to 10 to 15 years. Mm. Um, so not really a question, but just another thing for me to lie awake in bed at night thinking about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Isabel, can I throw so, it to you for something? Sure. I mean, on the question of, of countries influencing each other, of course. And I'm all for a fair competition of ideas. That's, that's not really what we're talking about here. Um, you know, if we had... I mean, imagine, imagine the situation in reverse, that Britain was, was competing in China for, for you know, the, the ideas and attention of the Chinese people. We, you know, China can broadcast here, it can distribute newspapers here, it can, you know, uh, it, there is a marketplace of ideas here. Try and do that in China and you will find that actually it's, this is a one-way, this is one-way passage and that, um, and that matters. Um, historic tensions, absolutely, I'm not defending British imperialism or the Opium War, um, but I would say that from, say from the mid-1990s to, I guess, around 2012, China benefited immensely from contact with the world. You know, without joining the WTO and, and you know, the global marketplace at a time when globalization was uh, at its height, China would not be where it is now. Massive amounts of FDI into China, huge transfer of, of technology and expertise, um, not all from Britain by any means, a lot of it from Hong Kong and Taiwan and Germany and, you know, other industri the industrialized West. And it was a time when, um, to, the, to the point about what, how much leadership changes things in China, that was a time of a far greater openness in China, both to ideas and to engagement uh, with the West. It was, a, you know, it, it had its own problems uh, that decade, but it was far more open than it is now. When uh, Xi Jinping becomes uh, uh, party secretary and uh, party chairman and um, president in uh, 2012, essentially, and in 2013, there is a leak of a document called Document 9, which um, you may have heard of. If you haven't heard of it, it was uh, an itemization of the things that the party regarded as, as serious threats. And that serious sets that must be struggled with, you know, in, in, as, a, as a priority, as a party priority. And it was pretty much a list of everything that makes a liberal society. So it was free press, separation of powers, uh, independent legal system, um, civil society, historical nihilism, all of these things which we would take as pretty core values of a society that we live in and would like to see other people benefit from were regarded as as mortal threats to the party. And pretty much since then, you know, that has been enacted. So yes, you know, the party didn't have to go that way. This is a choice. So Xi Jinping has taken it in that direction. So that's a direction of extreme nationalism, um, rising xenophobia, um, concerns about um, geopolitical tensions, those have all risen in this time. And they've partly risen because China is a more advanced technolo technological society and therefore, yes, a greater threat to Western interests. And we can go into that. So, and, you know, Donald Trump and the US pushback and all of that has, has raised tensions to the point where we are really in a kind of confrontation. And the methodology of that confrontation 
really matters to us. Um, and you know, who wins matters to us. And whether our values, whether we can you know, live as we wish in our own country matters to us. You know, we're not talking necessarily about, I certainly wouldn't talk about exporting democracy to China. That would be very foolish. Um, but, but I don't particularly want Chinese values imported uh, here, you know, because I'd rather, I'd just rather not. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> kind of you to offer. Um, so, so, yeah. Um, well, it's probably, yeah, did I deal with the questions? Yeah, definitely. Oh, Ella, uh, Ella, yeah. I'm just linking to a point you made earlier. I've also talked to Poppy about this recently, as the Great Translation Movement, just as like a mm. fight against this brick or steel wall that China has up at the moment for media outlets and mm -hmm. this growing movement of Chinese diaspora mm -hmm. translating popular tweets, popular videos, yeah. virals that are going on the TikTok. It's fascinating. It's um, very interesting. Following it on Instagram and some of the things that they post are actually quite um, violent. Some of the cultures of bullying when someone doesn't fit in line or they're a social outcast. Awful. The proper abuse, it's awful. Um, and yeah, just kind of thinking about what impact that might have in the West and that relationship, and if that movement is growing, if it's being used in politics, yeah. how that is influencing, because it's relatively new to my understanding, but I'm not sure. Well, it's not, I mean, it, it, yes, it's become more virulent, and, and it's partly a, a, a result, pretty much since 1989, when the party had to think of a new story. You know, why do you need the Communist Party forever? Um, after all, a lot of Communist parties had not survived. and you had just put tanks in against your students who were asking for democracy. So you needed a new story. And the story was, uh, China was you know, a big and important country until the evil West brought it down and the evil foreigner continues to conspire against China. That's the core story. So they, they set about a kind of, a, a whole program of, of, of education of young people in you know, pretty muscular, virulent nationalism. Uh, it's, it's, um, and it has its, and you also narrow, you narrow the range of permitted speech in China to the point where the only kind of safe expression of politics is in what the party directs. So that's xenophobia, nationalism, increasingly now anti, uh, anti-gay, anti kind of divergent lifestyles. You know, we're, we're seeing a real kind of retrenchment of tolerance in China. Uh, which is pretty worrying. And that's how, if you are a blogger or you're active on social media, it's safe and you get a lot of, you know, covert or overt um, um, party support. So you get a big following, so you make money. So, hey, so it, then you create a kind of, you know, the, the acceptable um, terms of speech and discourse on the net in China. So all of that goes on, but it's not the whole of China. Not everyone thinks like that. It's just that people in times like these learn, you know, they learn what not to say as well as, as, well, as, well as what they do say. Um, just on the question of whether, you know, why we should worry about, about all this. I think, you know, the last year we've had some lessons in dependencies and how they can go wrong, you know, just from Russia. You know, we have suddenly discovered that, you know, not all investment is sound investment, that not all dependencies are good for national security because they can be weaponized at moments like this. So, you know, you watch the European Union, Germany in particular, struggling with the weaponization of energy supplies from Russia. And you start to think about, OK, so what is the relationship with China like? Were we to come to a confrontation and China has weaponized its trade uh, supremacy in lots of cases Australia Lithuania lots of Sweden lots of countries have found that if somebody says the wrong thing or if the Dalai Lama visits or you know for some reason uh, you displease Beijing you you do feel the lash now so things like um, Xinjiang and how you how as a as a, as a trading nation, we deal with the question of labor conditions in Xinjiang. It's pretty complicated. The whole question of soft supply chains is pretty complicated. Um, and, and China is increasingly uh, using its muscle uh, to make sure that, you know, politicians in other countries toe the line. So these are dependencies which um, we need to think about because I can't see the tensions between China and the United States, uh, our closer ally, 
relaxing at all, at least for a decade. I can't really see the change of direction in China coming. I think it will come, but I think it's going to be a while. So we have to look at the vulnerabilities that we have created by our relationship with China. It might include, do we really want China running on bits of our critical infrastructure, like nuclear power stations, which David Cameron was terribly pleased about? Maybe not. Mm. But we, I think that just, we're going to come back to that. What, what are the bits? Because Isabel's found a bit that she has managed to have a really good dialogue with China about. So we'll come to that the, there might be strategic areas that we don't want to engage with, but there are areas that we really can, and, and so we'll, we'll come to that. But first, I'd love to um, come to Daniel. It's always good to get a historian involved, I think. And Daniel is um, a psychoanalyst and a historian, and he's just been working on the history of thought control. And so um, I've been talking to him as well in the making of our last podcast, and I don't know, I was just really interested in what Mark was saying about turning a blind eye to Xinjiang and Hong Kong and also talking to Isabel before about how more generally this, the human rights kind of discourse has died anyway and it's, it seems like we, we think that as long as everyone's getting richer, it's kind of okay, you know, that, that, will, that will sort everything out and it just, we're kind of beginning to realise that that hasn't, if that's not working, that's not what's happening. So, Daniel, could you help us to think about what, what's go what are our blind spots, what, what's going on in terms of why have we let, in a way, China have such big influence over... I mean, part of that you've already been talking about, really, which is the present, you know, the current conjuncture since this great expansion economically of China, since the turn of the century, the, well, the 1990s on into the the new millennium and the conjuncture with that and the new technologies, the sort of more panoptical possibilities of digital surveillance and our digital footprints. And, and of course, for Chinese citizens, you know, all the more to be tracked by on, online and through cameras, the forest of cameras and the putting together all of that, which is, is, is new in a way in the last 20, 25 years. And so there's something that has to be addressed that's different. And Isabel, however, was also talking about the Cold War and the earlier context of soft power and the, you know, the Soviet Union and the, the US and the both sides using, when you've already been thinking, Poppy, about cinema and the role of cinema. But I think it is useful just to contextualize this. And this is what I, I've been very interested in trying to do in my research on this and book on brainwashing, because in a way it is post-war, it is very early on with the People's Republic that you get a new language about the mind and about freedom of mind uh, that emerges and not just the word brainwashing which comes into the English language in 1950 um, on both sides of the Atlantic there are journalistic pieces in 1950 saying there's this new phenomenon that comes from China and we need the Chinese word for this washing of the brain to understand that something new is happening a new kind of psychological warfare and this is back shadowed by earlier fears about the mass psychology of fascism and so there's an interwar story and you know both on the left the start stalinism and, and nazism and the idea of totalitarianism and the idea of a total possession of the mind totalism as it comes to be known post-war and so brainwashing becomes part of the, the conversation of the 1950s in extreme form the idea of a sort of total takeover of the mind particularly of prisoners and captive populations but also in these more subtle forms that perhaps we've been touching on of sort of influence or manipulation and the 50s brings not just the word brainwashing but other terms menticide this idea of the demolition of the mind is another coinage but group think um, uh, the captive mind the hidden persuaders is a influential 50s book on this hidden role of advertising in the west so there's a kind of new focus on the idea of re yet another word re-education and Mao's attempt to re-educate the sort of lumpen proletariat as he would see it into a sort of united people but the possibility also that western prisoners in China uh, you know or in during the Korean war crucially could be completely turned and lose their own freedom of will and become kind of stooges or apparatchiks and this really explodes at the end of the Korean war when 21 American POWs 
choose to go and live in China rather than to return to the US. And that's understood in the frame of brainwashing and that leads to a space of movies, including you know, stories like The Manchurian Candidate later on. But the, you know, this fascination and fear of the power of a state and also of sciences, the psychological sciences, really to, to manipulate the mind in covert ways. So I think we're still in a way, uh, our vocabulary now and our fears, uh, they're in one way different, it's a new conjunction, new context, but they're also still in, shaped by that language where we think of the mind and the spectrum between the ideal of the free mind and the dread of the totally tyrannized controlled mind. Mm. Thank you, Daniel. Phoebe, did you want to? Yeah, one, that was really fascinating. Um, <laughs> and, and two, um, so I've obviously I've had my eyes on a certain bit of news today, but something that's almost kind of slipped under the radar and I'm kind of unfortunately is the, the head of MI5 and FBI warning of the immense threat of China. And I'm just gonna say the, the last point that's made, which is the one that kind of made me go, ah, was, um, was one of them saying, China has far too long counted on being everybody's second highest priority. They're not flying under the radar anymore. And I think that's my question, especially in Russia, like have, have we really learned anything about this kind of dependency that we're in right now? Have we learned anything when we, we look to Taiwan and, and we look at the potential impact of something like that happening, which again, they also warn about. Have we learned in anything in terms of technology? I, I just don't feel like I have, we have at all. It's kind of a consistent term. We've gone, got quite comfortable with the idea of kind of large swathes of data being being used. And, and, and you know, at the, at the end, they kind of say, oh, well, there's legislation that we can put forward, but you know, the sanctions that we've put forward on Russia aren't working. And at the moment, it looks like, well, can, can you know, people like, can, can Biden simultaneously put sanctions on China, put sanctions on Russia, and kind of battle that on two fronts? It, it doesn't feel like it. And, you know, and I'm not trying to be like fear mongering about it and be like, I think we, we've got in trouble for saying World War Four and World War Five and World War something else in, in, our, in the sense maker. But I think at the same time, like, are we really, really understanding it that this is a kind of threat and it's kind of got lost in everything else today? But do we have the kind of levers to pull in the UK government or other major governments if, for example, something like Taiwan does happen? Like that's, I mean, that's a very big question, sorry. <laughs> but I, I don't feel like we have at the moment. Oh, Liz Truss is quietly confident, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think she may not entirely have mastered her brief on Taiwan. <laughs> is Maggie there in the chat, in the online, the Zoom? Maggie Lewis? Because she, is she there? Maggie, are you there? Yeah. Maggie I is, am. oh, you are. <laughs> Oh, it's great to see you. Mag so Maggie is, is, has been working in America on this issue and kind of unpicking a bit of what Trump put down to make it less racist, I would say, I guess, against Chinese people. Because I think, Ella, what you were saying about, you know, all these Chinese people are trying to, trying to make change. You know, I think when I speak to, like, my Chinese colleague journalist in, in, in Beijing, he's like, what are you guys doing? Like, we want you to be a strong example of democracy. <laughs> like, could you just project that? That that if you could do that, that would really help us. <laughs> like, and 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 so um, anyway, so Maggie, you you've been through a lot. America's ahead of us on this story. They've caught on to this China's influence. Well, Trump did really, actually, to his credit. He did it in a very clunky way, though. Um, and Maggie tried to sort that out so could you looking at us uh, what what would you say what would you advise us and what do you what, yeah oh can't hear you yet there we go it wouldn't let me unmute um so i'm not going to try to defend american democracy because it's a mess um but um speaking as someone who i'm actually i am back in the states now i'm in oregon but i've spent most of the last couple of years in taiwan and sort of interestingly, you know, the economist said, I moved from a flawed democracy to a full democracy by moving from the US to Taiwan, um, which goes to show you know, how challenging it is right now. 
But with respect to these issues, I think influence covers so many different aspects, and we're seeing that in this conversation. You know, it's one thing, we've had a big debate in the US about Confucius Institutes, for example, and university campuses. Those have mostly been closed down, conversation shifting more to this issue about the, the Chinese students associations, especially ones that receive funding from the Chinese government through various channels. Um, and, and making sure this is a real challenge, and I, I say this as a professor, that we want students to be able to debate in a, in a very passionate manner things they feel strongly about and to feel pride in their countries, but also to be aware of when there is particularly funding coming from places that um, might shape um, what is uh, allowed in that discourse. Now, with respect to the science side, uh, there's a lot going on there, and this is a moving parts in the US. So there's always been, even under the Obama administration, um, this goes back before Trump, concerns about economic espionage. And so the stealing of intellectual property and taking it to benefit a foreign country. Uh, the Trump administration put the label on it of the China initiative and really put that focus on uh, the sucking sound of IP going to China as they saw it. But uh, what we've seen under Biden is a, in, you know, that, that concern continues, but there's been a change away from the framing of being China specific in favor of a strategy for countering nation state threats, which includes um, intellectual property concerns, but also uh, an increasing emphasis on also transnational repression. We're seeing more charges for that coming out of the Department of Justice. And with respect to this, um, issue of the uh, disproportionate number of people of uh, Chinese heritage who have been investigated and prosecuted. Uh, there's a lot of interesting studies going now in the US trying to tease out how much of that is just because of prevalence of who would have contacts with China, then which case it makes sense that um, perhaps there are people who share some linguistic or cultural background would be prosecuted at a higher rate. But what's interesting to me is these studies are also showing that, for example, the Department of Justice didn't do as well as they usually do in prosecutions. A lot of these cases were dropped, which shows to me that there might be problems in how they're being brought in the first place, and also questions about, for example, charging um, and sentencing differentials. So I'll just say this is very much a conversation that's going on. The FBI and the DOJ is working with academia. Um, and so I think there, um, I'm very interested in what Ray uh, just said, Christopher Ray just said, of course, in the UK. Um, but I, I think there should be hopefully more conversations with UK and US. And I've also had conversations with colleagues in Canada who are dealing with similar issues, as well as Australia. So it strikes me this is a time that it's really ripe for a, a broader conversation amongst a number of countries. Thank you so much for that. Um, I guess we're going to come towards the end. So I, I just would love to us to try and think about what we have what to do, what we need to do. And, and I'm thinking a bit about the podcast that we just made on the subject, which was about an example in Hollywood. And um, we had two filmmakers. We had this Hong Kong filmmaker, Kiwi Chow, who um, is like an independent filmmaker. And he was totally, would never censor for the Chinese government. He made this film about the protests. And I thought, going into this podcast, that he would be the hero of our podcast, obviously. But then we had this other guy called Chris Fenton, who was compromising... Um, making huge compromises with Marvel movies to the Communist Party. He, he was even suggested putting Xi Jinping as a child, as a character <laughs> into one of the movies. Like, he was just totally up for it. And But then he had this realisation of what was at stake and ended up... him. He was the hero, actually. And it, it made me... Emma was asking me one day, do, do we, are we supposed to like him or are we not? And I, I thought I was really interested in that question because... In a way, it's easy to stand outside, but if you're just somebody who wants to work in the system and we want to engage with China, but we don't want to compromise on democracy, if you are someone like that, then what do you do? Yeah, that's, that's what, yeah. Sorry. Go for it. I don't want to interrupt you at all. No, no, um, yeah. But I found it really interesting you say that, you know, we can influence China with being a good democracy. And for me, I kind of remembered a tweet, actually, from the British Embassy, uh, kind of commemorating the Hong Kong Agreement and effectively, you know, having a go at China for going back on an international agreement. And then the Chinese embassy retweeted a picture of Boris Johnson next to the Northern Irish Agreement, effectively saying you've done exactly the same thing. And I suppose for me, it's, um, the major question is, kind of, the, even like for the Opium Wars, we've never publicly apologized for that to the Chinese government, even though they're very well aware of what we've done. 
And are we just accelerating the influence of China by these kind of mistakes we're making on the world stage? Question. <laughs> so, Isabel. Well, I, certainly Donald Trump did a lot to accelerate the influence of China on the world stage. I mean, to the point where if you, what should we do? Well, first of all, we should fix our own societies. We should fund our universities properly so that they don't get terrified at the thought of Chinese students not coming anymore. Chinese students come here because they want to come here. They want a, a, a British education. And it shouldn't be beyond our universities to say, this is what a British education is. It is free discussion. It is, you know, it is a marketplace of ideas. And that's what you're buying. That's what you're here for. Um, we tend to have, I mean, again, you know, just going back to the grisly um, golden era, this preemptive cringe that the idea that scary China holds all the cards. It's not, it's not the case. Actually, if you look at the balance of trade, you know, we... China sells far more to us than we sell to China. You know, we, we, who's, who's doing whom a favor here? Now, I'm not exaggerating British influence, particularly Brexit Britain, you know, as we've sacrificed a huge amount of, of influence. I'm not saying we can influence China. But, we, but at this point, the question is, how much are we prepared to let China influence us? And I think that is absolutely within our, within our grasp and within our capacities. But we have to believe in what we believe in, and we have to be prepared to fund what we believe in and stand up for what we believe in. And if we don't do that, well, frankly, you know, we don't deserve um, to, you know, the benefits um, of democracy. If you're not prepared to defend it, um, it's not, it's, uh, you know, then, then you, you don't deserve it. Um, but I also think we shouldn't make China into a cartoon villain. There is absolutely nothing to be said for that. China is a fifth of the world's population. And um, regardless of propaganda, many of them think quite differently from each other. Um, they, it's, and, you know, we all have liberal Chinese friends uh, who are having quite a difficult time at the moment. You know, making China into a kind of across-the-board enemy benefits nobody. We have been in some ways foolish. We are beginning to get into place, for example, a capacity to screen inward investment for national security, which the United States has had for quite a long time. You know, the, 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 the stage that we've got to in our respective economies is, is now that China is interested in advanced technologies, and it, it will buy up, you know, promising startups in this country for the technology. Do we really want that to happen wholesale? Do we want China's... Uh, relaxed attitude to fair competition, uh, to undermine uh, our capacity to produce our own technologies. That's what happened with 5G. It left, you know, Huawei in a very dominant position through subsidized, through, you know, various forms of subsidy at home. It meant it could undercut existing uh, Western companies and it left very few companies uh, standing, you know, to compete. So, you know, if you look at how these things played out, there are quite important lessons which are not all about having a kind of zero-sum confrontation with China. There are things we have to talk to China about. You know, we can't fix climate change without China. And China can't fix climate change without us. Remember that part of it too. Mm -hmm. So that cooperating with China isn't doing a favor to China. I mean, it isn't doing a favor to us. Mm -hmm. it, it's also, you know, that China has needs too. It needs to... And, and it understands those needs. So just have a bit more dignity and self-confidence. Um, think very hard about what we want to defend and how much we're prepared to pay for it and act accordingly. Oh, and fix our politics, dear God. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. we're just taking a step towards that today. Yeah. Um, no, you're making me think about what a Chinese historian who I spoke to about this said when she just said, China's always had an influence with Edgar Snow. You know, they've always been exerting. Oh, absolutely, yes. And it's just now, because you guys are vulnerable, your democracy is yeah. vulnerable, that's where you're feeling this influence and mm -hmm. why it's... A, and that, so what you were saying about university is so true. She just mm. sat. But when, when the Chancellor of the Exchequer goes to Xinjiang, as he did, and only talks about business and is then praised in the Chinese press for having the proper attitude, mm. you think, uh, maybe yeah. something's wrong here. Well, just... And we, I, oh, and when the then Prime Minister then takes a job with the Belt and Road Investment Company. Yeah. You think, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. 
but I mean, we, I know we have to end in a minute, so I would I'd like to give everyone just one last word. But I just wanted to say that Isabel, and I, I know I've already confessed that I'm a fan, so, but I do want to say with my objective journalist hat on that um, she is like a totally uncompromising journalist about China, incredibly critical in The Guardian, you can read it. And she has a non-profit website called China, China Dialogue, which has had a very successful dialogue with China about climate change and the environment. So it is possible to speak your mind, not turn a blind eye to any of these things, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and to collaborate and engage. So living example right here that it is possible. Um, so I, let's mark, Daniel, Mark, would you like to say anything before we... Yeah, yeah thanks, Poppy. Um, just really briefly, I think it's fascinating and it's stirring a lot of thoughts. Um, today in the UK has demonstrated the kind of little local chaos of democracy. And I wonder, maybe for another conversation, but whether China, the PRC's, lead, the CCP's leaders in China and in the PRC are a bit concerned about kind of democracy and chaos. I'm thinking of Wang Kuning when he visited the West in the, the late 80s. You know, he arrived as a, an enthusiast for inverted commas liberal values, but he returned deeply skeptical about them. And he's a close advisor of President Xi. So, so it, it's that sense of, you know, do our values create long-term ba um, benefit perhaps, or are they perceived to uh, by the leaders of China? And then how do we kind of sell that um, value for us? And perhaps that sort of recognition there, Isabel talked about the reciprocity in the relationship, but, but, you know, that's a bit of a jumble, but I, I think there's something in there for, for maybe another conversation. Thank you, thanks, Mark. Um, Daniel, do you have any? Yes, anything? just a final thought. I thought it's been a very interesting conversation. I mean, about soft and hard power and hidden and, and you know, avert, um, but also about the both sides of it. What is done to us uh, by powers, you know, state powers, and also I thought what's the conversation has touched on our collusions and the more subtle bargains people make with themselves or institutions make, whether it's Hollywood, whether it's the city of London, to sort of collude with something in, in these more self, it can also be self-deceiving or as you were putting it, Poppy, turning a blind eye. And so that, again, that's another whole vocabulary, isn't it? About denial, about disavowal, about, you know, ab about these kinds of compromises. And just to throw in one last thinker alongside Orwell and that kind of version, in 1953, Milos, the Polish poet and later Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, writer, wrote this book, The Captive Mind, about life in Stalinist P Poland, saying it's not just about Orwellian brainwashing. It is about these sort of complex negotiations and bargains people make to sort of get by and flourish or survive and sort of deceive themselves or keep something private hidden whilst performing allegiance. And that's a really interesting book to think about, perhaps, you know, in the context of the kind of more collusive webs of influence and support that, that people are talking about today. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Isabel, last word. Um, I, think that's, um, I think that last point is something to understand about China, that, um, that when, you live, when you live somewhere where the price of dissent is very high, as it is, at the moment in China. You know, that sort of keeping your private thoughts private and appearing to conform becomes pretty much, uh, it becomes a very widespread strategy. Um, I, I first went to China in the, in the Cultural Revolution to university, and one, um, there was a, it struck me that there was a very high performative element in Chinese political participation, and that you'd go on a visit, and some elderly person would be produced who would give a absolutely tear-jerking performance of the suffering before liberation and then you know bluebells and sunshine liberation comes and everything was totally wonderful now and and it was it was enacted with you know apparently real emotion and occasionally real tears but after you know the kind of after a couple of years you began to think this is really quite ritualistic and it absolutely was it could be switched on and off because people knew that was what it wanted and what they privately thought was probably something quite different. Always bear that in mind. We never judge people who live in, in totalitarian societies or authoritarian societies for the choices they make, because until you're faced with those choices, you don't know what you'd do either. Thank you. I'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>